Michelle Vialim. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have uh, four clarifications for Minister. The first clarification concerns the eligibility criteria for private sector candidates running for president. Now, um, I don't think Minister has addressed my point directly, and that is that the Constitution Amendment Bill that was passed in November specifically asked Parliament to make these definitions, to define uh, the definition of profit after tax and also shareholders' equity. And the bill uh, last November also required Parliament to prescribe what amounts to an insolvency event. But what we find in the bill today is that Parliament is passing this job on to the Minister to do, and the guidelines or purported guidelines in Section 5, C2 and 3 are too general. They just talk about the Minister having to have regard to the general law, to accounting standards, but these definitions are not before the House today. So I'd like Minister uh, to comment on whether he agrees with me that actually Parliament is not doing what the Constitutional Amendment Bill has asked it to do with regard to these definitions um, for private sector candidates. A second clarification concerns the counting of reserve election. Um, I think in Parliament in November, you know, the government has already accused me of the things that, that Minister Chan just repeated, and I have also answered that in November to say that I'm not accusing the government, the Prime Minister, of not telling the truth or that the AG Chamber's advice was not given. My point was simply that people find it hard to understand why we can we count as the first elected president. And if the advice from the AGC is such, it would be helpful if the government could consent to publishing it so that people can understand or try to understand the reasoning. That was the point being made. And um, he talked about the fact that I'm a lawyer and I can understand why clients may want to have a confidential communication. But the fact also remains that clients can choose to waive the confidentiality if they find that there's a purpose in, in publishing it. So I'm just asking why, you know, we can't have more illumination on, on why we're counting from President Wee Kim Wee. Um, the third point which the Minister made um, was um, refuting what I had said was um, perception of Singaporeans, including myself, that this uh, sudden announcement to, to count the next or the coming election for uh, president as reserved is um, in view of what happened at the recent uh, election in 2011. Um, I thank him for his sermon on uh, how the government always thinks long term. But I'd like to put this question which I have uh, received from my residents, which I did put uh, in November, but I don't think I, I have an answer to it. And that is, if the government isn't passing these laws for short term purposes, why doesn't the government agree to defer these changes for one presidential election? Since you say it's not a short-term purpose, I mean, wh why not? I don't, I don't recall an answer to that. And, and the last uh, clarification I'd like to ask Minister is, um, in his opening speech earlier, I think he, he mentioned that both sides of the House um, agreed in November that there should be a difference between presidential elections and parliament elections. Uh, I'm not sure what he actually means by that. Um, from what I recall, our position has been that the head of state, we believe, if you want him to be a unifying figure, uh, making him go through elections uh, is inconsistent with that. I don't think that our members uh, went on to suggest how the campaign rules for presidential elections could be refined because we don't believe that the president should go through an election. Madam Speaker, on Ms. Sylvia Lim's first point on the eligibility criteria, what Parliament is doing and asking the Minister to do is to make sure that whatever prevailing accountancy rules that is being practiced is adhered to. Now, that surely is better than what we here, being not in the profession, to make a set of rules and then have it updated. I think the accountants amongst us the people in the financial industries amongst us will know that the conventions, the rules, the practices in the industry evolves. And we are setting ourselves, benchmarking ourselves to these high standards that are agreed to by the professional bodies. Now that, I think, is an even better and stronger set of measures than we setting 
something in place and having to update it as regularly as what the accounting professions may be capable of. So that's the first thing. On the second point about the reserve election, I'm glad that Ms. Lim has confirmed that you are not casting any aspersions on Prime Minister Lee's integrity. And if that is the case, then the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Teo Chi Hien, has explained in November why the <coughs> counting starts from the second term of President Wee Kim Wee's term. And that is because President Wee Kim Wee was the first president to exercise the powers under the new elected presidency act. On the third, and on the second related point, you ask whether clients can choose to waive the things. And I think I have answered you, which is that as a lawyer, you know that there will be circumstances where you can choose to release the advice and you can choose to not release the advice. And what we have done is no different. So unless you are going back to challenge and casting doubt on the Prime Minister's integrity, the Prime Minister has stated on record in this House that it is, has taken advice from the AG and we take the Prime Minister's for it and it is the Prime Minister's prerogative as to whether he wants, wishes to release the advice as you have said. On the third point, about this claim that this is a sudden announcement, I will just make two points. Number one, we have had this debate for a very long time, over the last more than one year. The process was transparent. We set up the Constitutional Commission. We invited the Workers' Party and members of the public to present. The Workers' Party's position was that it will not appear before the Constitutional Commission to present its views, but it will come to this House. Last year, the Workers' Party came to this House with a proposal for a Senate, and we have debated that and we have made our own conclusions and we have moved on from there. So I don't think this is a sudden movement. And a second response to the third point that you mentioned, I think DPM Tio has also shared with this House why we are making the movement now. But as what the Constitutional Commission says, if there's a reason for us to act, then it is the onus on this government to act in the best interest of this country decisively. And that's why we have decided to do it in this term of government. On the, third, on the fourth point about the bipartisan support for us to try to depoliticize this, I will just refer Ms. Lim to the handset, uh, to the speeches made by Mr. Leon Pereira, and uh, I can show it to you afterwards, which in so many words agree with us that we want a presidency that is depoliticized. And we should find ways to do so. And the government has taken seriously the feedback from this House and the members of the public to see how we can depoliticize the presidency. Because its role is to serve as a stabilizer. Its role is to serve the custodial functions for this country in terms of its reserves and key appointments. Its role is to unite this country. So I'll be happy to pass this to you. Mr. Pritam Singh. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for going through some of the points that I raised. Uh, and the Minister mentioned that there would be regulations drawn up which uh, define how the co community committee would assess applicants. And correct me if I'm wrong in this understanding. Uh, but there are two points which I made which the uh, Minister did not address. One has to do with the NS requirement and the second is how community work would be assessed. That's the first question. The second question I just would like to uh, press the Minister on this issue of language in the case of a reserved election. So for example, a, 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 a presidential election has been reserved for the Malay, cons, uh, constituents, uh, Malay community. Um, would it not be difficult for the government to agree that Malay as a language would be an expectation of any candidate who would stand for that uh, election up to the level expected of students actually in school through the education system. Madam Speaker, may I respond to the two queries from uh, Mr. Pritam Singh? 
First, on the issue of citizenship, I think I will repeat my point here. Every Singaporean, every Singaporean, regardless of whether a new citizen or old citizen, made the same pledge of allegiance to this country. They have the privileges of being a Singaporean. They have also the responsibilities to being a Singaporean. As to whether they can best represent and unite Singaporeans, I think it's best left to the judgment of the Singaporean electorate. And I think our people, Singaporeans, are wise and discerning. So I don't think we need to make uh, overly prescribe this. Your question about how the community committee works, I think we have established precedence because this is how we have assessed the eligibility of the Malay candidates and the Indian and other minority candidates for the for the parliamentary elections in the past. And that has served us well, and I think the same mechanism will continue to work. On the issue of language, I would say that the community committee and the subcommittees, the respective subcommittees, will need to assess the person holistically. Yes, language will be one of the criteria, but we are also keenly aware that all of us, regardless of our race, language, religion, may practice our religion slightly differently may live our lifestyle differently. But the key is this. The key is this. Does the subcommittee, the community committee or the, com sub the respective Chinese, Malay and Indian subcommunity, do they consider that person belonging to their community as a package, holistically? I think that's the key point. So as to the how the work of the community I would how the work of the community work I would not want to prescribe their role, and I also it will be not my remit to comment on how they should go about doing their function. But the philosophy is, has never changed. The philosophy is that, as a package, do you believe that this person belongs to your community? And I believe that there are wise people enough, the, people, the wise people in the community, they are wise enough to know how to make that judgment call considering all the factors that you have mentioned. Mr. Leon Pereira. I'd just like to make a point of clarification to Minister Chan in relation to what he just said. The speeches that I made in November when we had the debate on the Constitution Amendment were speeches in support of the Workers' Party's position for an appointed president, for reverting to an appointed president and an elected Senate. They were not offering specific suggestions about campaigning procedures for an elected president. I was not agreeing with the notion that we should continue to elect the president and here are my suggestions for the procedures to run that campaign. They were supporting an appointed president and I would make the point, since it was brought up by Minister Chan, I would make the observation that the Constitutional Commission agreed with that point as well. I thank Mr. Leon Pereira for your clarifications. I'm just a bit puzzled. You said that the November speeches were in support of the appointed president. Was that what you mentioned just now? I thought the November debate was about the Senate. How, how does the appointed president and the Workers' Senate Party's proposal, proposal was for Sorry. an appointed president and elected Senate to exercise the custodial powers over civil service appointments and reserves that the elected president okay. currently holds. So, in fact, you are setting that out as a contradiction when there is no contradiction at all. We want to. We argued then for reversion so, to an appointed president and an elected Senate to handle the custodial role so that the elected president has. So, can I have on record that you are now proposing that we have an appointed president and a Senate? Is that correct? Is, is correct, right? Okay. So that never was, mind. Was, Today is not, not the time. Not only is it correct, it's what we've argued all along, and yeah. it's what we okay. argued in November. Okay. 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 So, so, so then let me ask, uh, but you would agree with me that we want a depoliticized president to the extent that our efforts can, because your line of questioning during November was that we try our best to have a president that can act as a unifying figure for our country. Is that correct? Do you share the perspective that we would like a president that can unify us 
and be depoliticized to the I extent possible. I agree with the goal, and I think we do not disagree on the goal of having a unifying mm -hmm. president as a symbol for Singapore. But yeah. what we disagree about is an elect elected presidency. Okay. We so argued then, and I argue again, that an election inevitably has a tendency to politicize the office of the president. Yes. An appointed president, like what we had in the past with President Yusuf Isha, mm -hmm. and what the Constitutional Commission itself called for, is a better thing for Singapore. Okay. I understand you. So you want to appoint a president and a senate, but as we have gone through in November, that would also have the same risk of politicization, maybe eight times over. But we are not to go there today. But what we can agree, I think, on both sides of the House is that, as you have mentioned, to the extent possible, we want a mechanism, an <coughs> election process that allows us to have a unifying figure and a custodial figure. And that's why we have proposed the slight adjustment to the campaigning methods today. And I think we can agree on that. Ms. Sylvia Lim. Madam, just to clarify once again, what Minister just said is not correct. We do not agree to an election process for the President. What do you say? You asked me. Okay. Madam President, I think today is not the occasion for us to go through this again. <laughs> I think we can all check the handset as to what was said between you and the rest of the debate. Today we are here to put in place the nuts and bolts on how we can get an elected president C working. Yes, DPM. Madam Speaker, I had the privilege of answering a clarification from Mr. Leon Pereira towards the end of the debate. And he specifically asked me uh, whether we would consider uh, the recommendations in the Constitutional Commission to make sure that election methods uh, were not politicized. Uh, election methods were such that the process were not politicized and referred to a speech made by Madam Rahayu. I don't have the hands out with me, but I stood up and I remember that I agreed with Mr. Leon Pereira that indeed we should look at these things and we would do so uh, during the uh, coming where we enact the uh, processes uh, in this bill. And indeed, that's what we're doing. And I'm glad that Mr. Pereira agreed with me at that point in time. Madam President, if I, I was about to... Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Ma ma Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, Madam, uh, Speaker sorry, my, my bad. Uh, Madam Speaker, just on the record, I was about to hand this to the, the, the focus party. The pre exact quote was this. My second question from Mr. Leon Pereira. My second question pertains to a question we have repeated a few times. What are the strategies that the government has to mitigate the risk of politicizing the unifying office of the president? And there is no doubt that politicization may not ha have fully materialized for the past EPs that we have, but there is good reason to believe in future presidential elections if, let us say, there are 10 candidates and let us say the winner gets 5% of the vote and let us say that the campaign ends up becoming bitterly partisan, the office of the president would be, could be politicized. So it goes on, and Mr. Tio Chi Hien's reply was, and I quote, turning to the risk of politicization and the possible tightening of rules for the presidential elections, the risk of politicization is there. I have addressed it explicitly just now in my answer, but I thank what Mr. Leon Pereira suggests and what the commission suggests also is to look at the rules and the way that the presidential elections are conducted. I think there is merit and I agree with Mr. Leon Pereira there. i quote from Mr. Tio Chi here. Mr. Pereira. I thank the Minister for sharing that extract from Hansa. But I think even as your own extract uh, makes clear, and referring back to the debate that uh, DPM Tio uh, cited, I did not support the idea of an elected presidency and making procedural changes to reduce the politicization risk in that election. I and my colleagues argued for the idea of a non-elected, an appointed uh, president because we argued and we still maintain that if you have an election, inevitably that politicization risk will emerge. There are various scenarios. I think uh, one of them was touched on in that extract, but inevitably there will be that risk. You can introduce procedural changes to campaign rules and so on and so forth and Minister Chan has shared some of those procedural changes today but you will not eliminate that procedural risk. That is why we argue then and we argue now that an appointed president like we had in the past, like President Yusuf Ishaq, 
is the best solution for Singapore. DPM? Yeah. Madam Speaker, I was very, very clear on that day, and I think the Hansard speaks for itself. Uh, and when I agreed with Mr. Leon Pereira, he was listening to me very attentively. And we all know that Mr. Pereira, um, I, how shall I say, is not shy to stand up to clarify a matter if he has not agreed with it at that point in time. And at that point in time when I agreed with him that we should uh, make uh, processes to uh, depoliticize the election of the president, he, he, did not, he did not respond at that point in time. I thank the DPM for his comment, but I think the totality of all that I said during the debate does not support a position that we should have an elected president but make procedural changes uh, such as the ones that have been announced today. The position that I articulated then, and I hold the same position now, is that we should revert to an appointed president because whatever procedural changes you make, you do not eliminate uh, that political risk. So I was not arguing that we should go down the path of procedural changes. The record for Mr. Leon's edification? So, uh, yes, DBM. Mr. Pereira, you can sit down. Yeah. Uh, and I quote, My second question pertains to a question we have repeated a few times. What are the strategies that the government has to mitigate the risks of politicizing the unifying office of the presidency? No doubt, the politicization may not have fully materialized for the past EPs that we have, but there's good reason to believe in future presidential elections if, let us say, there are 10 candidates and, let us say, the winner gets 5% of the votes, or let us say the campaign ends up becoming bitterly partisan, the office of the president could be politicized. I have not heard any strategy from any member of the PAP on how this can be managed. And it's quite clear, sir, Madam Speaker, that he's referring to electing the president. I continue uh, in Mr. Leon's word. I think Ms. Rahayu Mazam came closest to that, and to her credit, she talked about tightening up the rules for partisanship during the presidential election campaign. So what would be the government's strategy to mitigate that? That is my second question. And Madam, in my reply to him, I said, um, turning to the risk of politicization and the possible tightening of rules for the presidential elections, the risk of politicization is there. I've already addressed it explicitly just now in my answer, but I think what Mr. Leon Pereira suggests and what the Commission suggests also is to look at the rules and the way that the presidential elections are conducted. I think there's merit, and I agree with Mr. Leon Pereira there. As I said, Madam, Mr. Pereira is not shy to stand up to disagree if he has been understood wrongly. And he did not stand up to disagree with me at that point in time. Mr. Pereira. Debate. What I did call for was for the government to explain its strategy for managing the politicization risk and I felt that whatever had been explained up to that point in time was not sufficient safeguards to manage that politicization risk. I alluded to Ms. Rahayu Mazan's uh, comments as being one attempt to, to explain a strategy but I, I pointed to the fact that there uh, had not been a proper strategy explained at that, at that time and I think some of the procedural changes that have been uh, suggested today are uh, an attempt to manage that, that politicization risk, but that my, my statements then cannot be construed to mean that I support uh, an elected presidency with procedural changes. What I'm saying is that an elected presidency inherently has that risk. There is that inevitable tendency. There, is no, uh, there was no comprehensive strategy to, to, to manage that, and you can make procedural changes, you can make tweaks here and there, but at the end of the day, an election still runs the risk of becoming politicized, even if you um, make all kinds of uh, procedural changes. That is why an appointed presidency is still a better solution, and the Constitution Commission itself actually pointed, pointed that out. My, my statements in the November debate did not constitute a support of an elected presidency with procedural safeguards. Madam, I thanked Mr. Leon Pereira for agreeing that we should have political safeguards uh, at that debate. He did not clarify. I thank him again for agreeing that we should have political safeguards.